So welcome back. Uh, it's good to be lecturing again. Uh, so last time we had a lecture was Monday, and uh, unfortunately the 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 quality was kind of poor, and I'm not sure people got a lot out of the lecture um, because of the the poor quality. Um, so thankfully it was our pause for breath day, so so we weren't uh, necessarily covering anything of vital importance. A lot of it was. Uh, like me answering questions from the start of course survey, that kind of thing. But um, but I thought we would just hit the highlights of the uh, the more important things that we did talk about on Monday, uh, just to make sure that that uh, that everybody got them. So uh, we wrapped up our discussion of these strongly consistent replication protocols, uh, primary backup uh, replication and chain replication. Uh, so. Uh, these strongly consistent replication protocols we observe that they work by establishing some sort of total order. On operations. So primary backup replication we saw Let's do three. We could have three backups and a primary. And the way that it works, uh, as we discussed before, is that the primary, or clients rather, talk to the primary. The primary talks to all of the backups, sends a broadcast to all the backups. Those backups respond to the primary. And the primary then acknowledges the client, and this is the point right here at which uh, at which the write commits. So this is the write path. And the read path is that the client uh, just talks to the primary. So we said that this provides some degree of fault tolerance, right? And the fault tolerance that it provides is that. If a replica crashes, another replica can take over for it. So if a backup crashes, uh, we can just bring up another backup uh, um, by cloning the primary and having that backup uh, replace it. Uh, if the primary crashes, then uh, then we have to um, uh, we have to be careful, right? Because we want to make sure that uh, um, that we don't have that we're not picking up any rights from the future, right? If we clone one of the backups. The backup might have rights on it that that uh, that, that the client didn't uh, get acknowledged. Uh, so so recovering from a primary crash is a little bit harder, but still possible. Um, but ultimately, we have to have some sort of coordinator node that is responsible for making sure that uh, well, it's responsible for for knowing who's up at any given time. And it's responsible for knowing which which roles those nodes are playing, and for telling the client who they should be talking to, who is serving in the role of the primary. So there's some state on saved on this coordinator right now, and the coordinator keeps track of who is the primary, who are the backups. Um, in the case of chain replication, if we have the client. We have a head. Let's say that we have, um, a, say, two in the middle and a tail. So the exact number of nodes in the chain is uh, is is not important. Uh, just like with primary backup, uh, it's it's not important. There's I often draw these diagrams with a specific number, but don't get hung up on that. Um, so in this case, um, the client's going to read uh, from the head. The head is going to uh, or excuse me, the client's going to write to the head. The head is going to forward that message on. And the tail is going to acknowledge the client. This is the commit point right here. For chain replication. And then reads are going to happen to the tail. And so here again, you have to have some sort of coordinator who's responsible for 
knowing when processes fail, perhaps by sending them a ping periodically and seeing if they respond to it, and then uh, declaring that they're, they've failed if it doesn't uh, hear back. Uh, and then it also has to know who's playing what role at a given time and making sure that the client knows who the head and the tail are so the client knows who to contact for reads and writes. Um, so what we, what we talked about at the end of, of last time is the fact that this, this coordinator is, is really a, a, a single point of failure, right? If we just have one coordinator process here, if the coordinator fails, uh, everything falls apart. So, so what do we do? Well, what you really have to do is have some sort of replication of the coordinator also. And so in so doing, you have these three processes that behave as though they're a single process. And then you get some fault tolerance for the coordinator. So these processes, you have, you, you have it's still not great when they fail, right? But, uh, but you have some rules that you can follow if one of them crashes. Uh, with the coordinator, um, you really don't want the coordinator to crash. So instead, uh, instead of having a single coordinator process, uh, you have to do something like having some collection of processes that you hope behave as one process. Somebody's asking if this is expensive and slow. Well, yeah. So if you want strong consistency, you ultimately have to rely on something that is going to make these coordinator processes behave as though they're one process. So this is, again, this is if you want strong consistency. So this might be one reason why you might want to avoid having strong consistency, right? Uh, strong consistency isn't always the best choice. Uh, so how do we ensure that these three processes actually behave like they are the same process? And that, that leads us into the next topic uh, that we're going to begin discussing today, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is consensus. So, and it's interesting, I talked about this a little bit on Monday, but when you look at the chain replication paper, um, they, they state an assumption. They say, we assume the coordinator doesn't fail. And then, they, uh, they admit that that's an unrealistic assumption, and they explain that in the actual implementation that they have, um, they do instead have a group of coordinator process like the processes like this that are running a consensus protocol among them to make sure that they are agreement, in agreement with one another. So there are times when you really do need consensus. Um, so let's start to talk about those. Okay, so one is you have a bunch of processes and you need to make sure that they all deliver some, the same messages in the same order. Actually, all of the examples that I have are going to start with you have a bunch of processes. So let's, let's write that up here. Okay, so that's one situation. Here's another. You have a bunch of processes and you need them all to keep track of which processes exist. You need them all to keep a list of which processes exist. And whenever anyone dies or leaves for whatever reason, everyone's list has to get updated. So we'll say you need them all to know which processes exist and 
are running. Okay, here's another one. You have a bunch of processes and you want one process to play a particular distinguished role and you want to let every process know about it. So you have a bunch of processes and you want one process to play a distinguished role and you want other processes to know about it. Here's another one. You have a bunch of processes and you want them to take turns getting mutually exclusive access to some resource. Like a file or something. Here's another situation. You have a bunch of processes and they're all participating in a transaction of some kind. and you need them to agree on whether the transaction is committed or, abort or aborted. So it turns out that these are all classic distributed systems problems. And they have names. So this first one is called the totally ordered broadcast problem, also called atomic broadcast. So we'll call it totally ordered broadcast. The second one you need, you need to know uh, which, you need all the processes to know which other processes exist and are running. Um, this is called the, the group membership problem. And if they can fail, then it's also called the failure detection problem. Uh, number three is called the leader election problem. So let's see, I don't have much room, but I'll write group membership here. Failure detection. This is leader election. Number four, you want them to take turns getting access, mutually exclusive access to some resource. Um, this is the distributed mutual exclusion problem. And this last one, they're all participating in transaction and you need them to agree on whether it's committed or aborted. Uh, this is the distributed transaction commit problem. So what do all these problems have in common? What would you say they all have in common?
Okay, so someone on Slack says they can all be solved by implementing consensus. So we do say, yeah, when do you need consensus? But, but uh, okay, so, but they all, why, why do you need consensus? Well, they all involve this bunch of processes trying to coordinate with one another and reach agreement about something. So the thing they're trying to agree on could vary, right? They could be trying to agree, agree on the order to deliver messages in, right? That's what totally ordered broadcast is about. They could be trying to agree on whether or not a process has failed. You have to do that for failure detection. They could be trying to agree on who, who the leader is uh, in leader election. They could be trying to agree on who currently gets access to a shared resource. That's what the distributed mutual exclusion problem does. Or they could be tr trying to agree on whether or not to commit a transaction. So the details vary, but all of these are going to boil down to the consensus problem, which is the problem of getting a group of processes to coordinate and agree on something. So, so let's try to formally define the consensus problem. And I should point out that what makes this hard in distributed systems is faults. So crash faults and omission faults are the ones that we're going to be considering. In fact, mostly just crash faults because it's really hard. It's hard enough even then, even just in the case of crash faults. Okay, so this problem of getting processes to agree. Oh, somebody has to see this again. This says distributed transaction commit down here. Okay. So we, we have some processes, we want to get them to agree. And to make things simple, Let's say that the thing that they're trying to agree on is just one bit, zero or one. So every process gets to have a say, and every process gets to contribute one bit, zero or one. So we could draw a box like this. So this box implements consensus. And here are the processes that are inputs to it. So we're going to say every process has to uh, gets to contribute a bit. And let's say the bits happen to be 0, 1, and 0. The consensus problem is to design a protocol so that everybody comes out agreeing on a value. So it could be this. Or it could be this. So you might look at this and think, oh, well, that's easy, right? zero is the majority, so just go with zero. Or if one had been the majority, just go with one. Uh, and indeed, this notion of majority is going to be important. Uh, but what you have to keep in mind is that there isn't some external process that looks at these numbers and makes the choice. Rather, it's these three processes coming in without any knowledge of what number the other ones picked that have to coordinate among themselves and reach a point where they all agree and they have to do it in the presence of failure and asynchrony. So we're gonna talk about uh, one of the best known algorithms for consensus, but before we do, um, I wanna to start to talk about the properties that consensus algorithms try to satisfy. Um, so the first of these properties is termination. Let's start a new page for this actually.
So termination. This says that each correct process eventually decides on a value. So if termination holds, then you're eventually going to get something out of this consensus box on every line. Note that we haven't even said that what you get on every line is the same yet, just that you get something. So that's what termination gives you. Termination says that eventually you're going to get something on every line. Well, then you also have agreement. So this says that all correct processes agree on the same value. So if anybody outputs a zero, then they all do. And if anyone outputs a one, then they all do. So let's imagine for a moment that this was it. Imagine that these were the only two properties that, that we had to satisfy. If these were the two properties that we had to satisfy in order for it to be a, a consensus algorithm, then what could we do to implement consensus that would be really, really simple? <laughs> Make all the processes crash. Well, okay. That's a fair answer. That wasn't actually the answer that I was expecting. Um, okay, let's, let's suppose that the, um, other than that. Uh, okay, so how would we implement consensus? How would we make them all agree on the value, on a value, if these are, if these are the only two properties that we have to satisfy? Yeah, okay, so there's some good suggestions. Um, one person says, just choose the first value, or somebody else says, have a default value and not care about the input. Yeah, so yeah, you could just say, have everybody output zero, ignore the input, or have everyone output one. There, consensus, solved. Well, we can't do that. So we have to have a third property. Um, this is called, I'm gonna call it validity. Uh, but sometimes it goes by other names. Uh, some people call it integrity. Some people call it non-triviality. Um, but I'm going to call it validity. Validity just says the agreed upon value must be one of the proposed values. So that rules out the possibility of just ignoring the input and always outputting the same thing and claiming to have solved consensus then. Okay, so termination, agreement, validity. I said that consensus algorithms try to satisfy these properties. Um, but it turns out no consensus algorithm actually does satisfy them all, at least not in the asynchronous network model. Does anyone know why no consensus algorithm actually satisfies all three of these?
So the short answer is because it's impossible. This is the famous uh, FLP result, what's known as the FLP result in distributed systems. It's called FLP uh, because it was proved uh, by Michael Fisher, Nancy Lynch, and Michael Patterson. So those are their initials, FLP. Uh, this came from their 1983 paper. So it says that you can't have all of these properties be true uh, in the asynchronous network model and the crash fault model. So if crashes can occur and messages are asynchronous, uh, you can't have all this be true. The paper is called Impossibility of Distributed Consensus with One Faulty Process. So it turns out you always have to compromise on one of these things. Which one do you think we're going to compromise on? Yes, there's a mathematical proof for it. Uh, and I encourage you to check out the paper if you want to see the proof. Um, so if you have to compromise on one of these properties, which one do you think you're going to compromise on? Validity. Well, that's an interesting suggestion. OK, so instead of going to all the trouble to implement a, uh, the consensus algorithm, uh, we could just say, OK, um, the agreed upon value is, is 5. But I'm not sure that that would um, be very useful, right? It would solve the problem, but uh, it would solve the consensus problem that we wrote down, right? But it wouldn't necessarily help you get anything done. Okay, somebody else suggested agreement. Okay, well, if you compromise on agreement, then okay, but then then you don't then you don't have consensus, right? Then then you're back where you started, right? Because if you compromise on agreement, then looking back at this picture. You started with 0, 1, 0. If you compromise on agreement, then maybe you'll come out with 0, 1, 0 also. So compromising on agreement doesn't seem great. That only leaves one possibility, right? You have to compromise on termination. So we can have a consensus algorithm, but it doesn't necessarily terminate. So with termination, compromise, it means that if you get a response on all the processes, then it's going to be the same, right? We have agreement. And we also know that the response we get is going to be one of the initial values, because we have validity. But it's also possible that we just won't get an answer at all, right? This could happen. So non-termination could happen, and we have to be OK with that. And if a run of the consensus protocol doesn't terminate, at some point, we have to shrug and say, OK, it's not terminating. Let's try again. And of course, that run might not terminate either. OK. So with that, I think we're almost ready to start talking about an actual consensus algorithm. Um, let's do a quiz question first. So before we do the quiz question, uh, let's talk about the, the last couple of quiz questions. Um, I can't remember if we talked about the um, uh, answer to quiz number 12 yet. Uh, 
if we talked about it on Monday or not. Um, anyway, what it uh, the the question here was, what does it mean for a replicated storage system to be strongly consistent? And the, the answer we were looking for here is informally, what it means is that uh, clients can't tell that the data is replicated. So for quiz number 13, We, we said this is about uh, chain replication versus primary backup. So we said throughput if throughput is number of actions completed per unit of time, when does chain replication provide better write throughput than primary backup replication? Uh, so the answer here was if you have a mix of writes and reads, because if you just had if you just had writes, uh, then they're all going to be hitting the head node. If you just had reads, they're all going to be hitting the tail node. So then there's no in, uh, uh, advantage to using chain replication versus primary backup. So you have to have a mix of reads and writes. Uh, and furthermore, the particular mix of reads and writes that seems to be most advantageous for chain replication is if you have uh, about 10 or 15 percent writes and the rest reads. And that's what the uh, empirical evaluation in the chain replication paper bears out. So those are the circumstances when chain replication provides better write throughput, when your balance of writes and reads is 10 or 15 percent writes and the rest reads. That's what we were looking for there. All right, on to today's quiz question. And the form should be open. I will send out the link. We'll wait a couple more minutes.
All right, let's move on. Uh, somebody asked, uh, what's the difference between termination and validity? So, so here's an example of a violation of validity. If you get some inputs, say, 110, or even if, let's just say, even if we're only dealing with bits, let's say all the possibilities are, uh, the only possibilities are 1 and 0. Um, so let's say all the inputs are 1, and the output is 0. This would be a validity violation. Um, a termination violation would be if some or all of the processes just don't ever uh, agree upon, just don't ever have an answer at all. All right. So I think we're ready now to start talking about uh, an actual consensus algorithm. Paxos. So Paxos is a consensus algorithm uh, invented by Leslie Lamport. Uh, he first tried to publish it in 1990, but it took eight years for anyone to publish the paper. And in the original paper that he, that he wrote about it, he used an analogy to parliamentary procedure with laws and voting and ballots. And to this day, some people use that terminology to explain Paxos. Others don't. So I'm going to avoid the laws and voting and ballots terminology, and I'm going to stick mostly to the terminology that he adopted later uh, in a paper called Paxos Made Simple, uh, which came out in 2001. So Paxos is really not just one algorithm, uh, but it's a family of algorithms, meaning there are many variants of it or flavors of it. And we're just going to talk about boring vanilla Paxos for now. Um, so in Paxos, there are three roles that a process can play. Proposer, acceptor, and learner. So proposers propose values. Acceptors actually choose from the proposed values or contribute to choosing from the proposed values. And learners learn the agreed upon value. So one thing to point out is that in practice, a single node might take on multiple roles or even all of them. So one process in practice might be all three of proposer, acceptor, and learner. But when you're learning Paxos, it's easiest to talk about the roles separately. So we'll call any node that plays any role a Paxos node. And when we draw Lamport diagrams of runs of Paxos, uh, we're going to have particular processes and we're going to say, okay, this process is the proposer, this process is the acceptor, this process is the learner, and so on. Um, but in practice, there might be one machine uh, that's actually playing multiple roles. 
one thing uh, that Paxos nodes, uh, any node that's playing any role, one thing that they have to know is how many acceptors a majority of acceptors is. So for example, if there are three acceptors, a majority of acceptors is two. If there are five, a majority is three. So all the nodes have to know how many is a majority. That's a fact that they have to know in advance. So that information needs to have gotten to them somehow before the algorithm runs. Another thing is that Paxos nodes have to be able to persist data so they don't forget what they accepted. And then one other thing to keep in mind here is that the protocol that we're looking at is for deciding on a single value. So if you want to decide on a sequence of values, which is a common thing to want to do, then you have to run the protocol again. And there's more to say about that, and there's optimizations that you can do then, but we're not going to talk about that yet. We're just going to talk about a protocol for deciding on one value. OK, so let's look at an actual run of the algorithm. And I'm going to start a new page because we're going to need all the room we can get. So for simplicity, uh, let's say there's one proposer, and I'll call her P1. Um, and let's say there's three acceptors and two learners. So in this case, uh, what would uh, what would a majority of acceptors be? That's right, yeah, the majority would be two. Okay, so. Let's say that our proposer, P1, wants to propose a value. So the first thing that it has to do is send what's called a prepare message to a majority, at least, at least a majority of acceptors. So it's going to send a message that's called prepare. And that message is going to come along with what it calls the proposal number. The proposal number has to be unique. So no one else can use it. So if you had multiple proposers, you might establish rules in advance. Like if you had two proposers, maybe you would say that one proposer could only use odd numbered proposal numbers and the other one could only use even numbered proposal numbers. That has to be established in advance. Something else about the proposal number is it also has to be higher than any that the, that the proposer has tried before. So it has to be able to store the proposal numbers it's used and make sure not to reuse them. So we're going to say that proposer one sends a, a prepare message with a proposal number. Let's say that the proposal number is five. And it's going to send it to a majority of acceptors. So we'll say this message is prepare five. And let's say that it gets sent to acceptor one and acceptor two. When an acceptor gets a prepare message, it looks at that number, that proposal number, and it does this check. Did I previously promise to ignore requests with this proposal number? If it did, then it ignores it. If no, it now promises to ignore any request that has a proposal number lower than that. So it replies to the proposer with a promise message. So in this case, it's going to be promise five. So a promise of n means I will ignore any request with a proposal number lower than n. We're going to have to come back and talk about this more later. Uh, but this is for, for today, this is what we'll say. 
Okay, so let's say that the proposer one sends prepare five to these two acceptors, A1 and A2, and suppose they both respond with promise of five. So now we've gotten a, ma a majority of our acceptors to promise five. So keep in mind, five is only the proposal number. It's not the value that we're deciding on. It's just a proposal number. But at this point, we've sort of reached a milestone because now, the, now that a majority of acceptors have promised five, now there can never be a majority that promised four or anything less than five. A minority might still promise four, but it's going to be impossible for a majority to do so. Because with this promise, they're saying, from now on, I'm going to ignore any request that has a lower proposal number. Okay, back to the proposer. Now that the proposer has received promise messages from a majority of, it, of acceptors, it can now send what's called an accept message uh, to a majority of acceptors. And the accept message is going to have the proposal number that was promised and the actual value that it wants to propose. This is something else that we're going to have to come back to. I'm, do, I'm, I'm giving you the simple version now. So, it's going to send an accept message. Let's say, again, for simplicity's sake, that it talks to the same two acceptors. And the accept message is going to have the proposal number. That's five in this case. And then there's the actual value that we're proposing, which we haven't started to talk about yet. Let's say that the value we're proposing is zero. So our accept message will be accept five zero, and we'll send it to a majority of acceptors, at least a majority of acceptors. We'll just say that they happen to be the same ones we've been talking to so far. Now what? Well, the acceptors get the accept message. When an acceptor gets an accept message with a proposal number and a value, It's going to ask itself, did I previously promise to ignore requests with this proposal number? If so, it ignores it. If no, it did not promise to ignore those requests, then it replies with accepted and the proposal number and the value. And it also sends that accepted message to all the learners. So the point, when a majority of acceptors send these accepted messages for a particular proposal number and a particular value, is the point when consensus is reached. So where is that point? So right here is the point where they send those messages. So the consensus is on the value, zero. It's not actually necessarily on the proposal number. But from this point onward, in this run of Paxos, we have consensus on the value. And notice that not everyone knows it yet. In particular, it's the point at which these messages, these two messages from the acceptors to the proposal, to the proposer are sent that consensus is reached. So the proposer doesn't even know yet. And the acceptors don't know about the other acceptor, right? And the learners certainly don't know yet. Uh, 
So not everybody knows that consensus has been reached, but it has at this point. So at the point, finally, when a proposer or a learner gets accepted messages from a majority of acceptors for a particular proposal number, then they know that consensus has been reached on the value that goes with the proposal so that, that goes with that proposal number. So it's right here that proposer one has learned that consensus has been reached. And of course it's right here and right here that these learners know that consensus have, has been reached. So there's a difference between the moment at which consensus is reached and the moment at which everybody finds out that that's the case. So there's a couple of places where I said uh, I was I was simplifying things. And those we're going to have to go back and patch up because what we actually do in those cases is more subtle than what I described here. Um, but rather than going through that right now, um, we'll talk about that more uh, next time when we talk about having more than one proposer. And we'll also talk about fault tolerance next time uh, because that's what makes things more interesting. Hopefully we'll also have time to talk about why the algorithm isn't guaranteed to terminate. Uh, so we do have validity here and we do have agreement, but we don't have termination. So we'll talk about uh, why that's the case. All right, I'm looking back at chat for questions. So one person asked, uh, if a previous value is one, all future values have to be greater than one or can it be zero? So one important thing to distinguish between is the difference between a proposal number and the value being agreed upon. So here, five was the proposal number and zero was the value being agreed upon. Zero was just a value uh, that I chose, right? I could have also picked one um, or I could have picked uh, the string cat or I could have picked something else. Um, that, uh, that's kind of uh, irrelevant here. It's just, it, in this case we're saying, uh, in keeping with the earlier example where we had to agree on one bit, I decided to make it zero. But it also could have been something else. Um, the proposal number is what has to go up over time. So a given proposer, when it sends a particular proposal number, not only has, does it have to be unique, um, but it also has to be higher than any that that proposer has tried before. Um, so if this proposer were to send out a new proposal at this point, let's say that this proposer is using odd numbers, then it would have to send a prepare seven message. So somebody asked, how, uh, when do acceptors or how do acceptors find out that consensus is reached? Yeah, okay, good question. So when I said earlier that um, in practice a single node could take on multiple roles or even all of the roles, your acceptor nodes might also be playing learner roles. So learners are nodes that learn the agreed upon value, right? In practice, acceptors might be learners too. It's just easier to draw this picture if we have distinct processes here. But in practice, a given node might be playing the acceptor role and might also be playing the learner role. So that's how it would find out that consensus had been reached because it was playing the learner role and then it would be getting these learner messages. So if you want a node to be able to find out about the agreed upon value, then it had better be a learner. Same goes for, so this proposer is going to receive accepted messages from the majority of acceptors, but if you had some other proposer somewhere, if you wanted that proposer to find out about the, the agreed upon value, if there was an agreed upon value, then that node had better actually be playing the learner role as well. Other questions? Okay. 
OK, so I want to try to write down the steps of the algorithm. with an asterisk for those simplifications that we made. So we said when an acceptor gets a gets a prepare in message. It asks Did I previously promise to ignore requests with this proposal number. If yes, it ignores it. If no, it now promises to ignore any request with a proposal number lower than n And it replies to the proposer, whoops, with a promise and message. I'm going to put an asterisk here. meaning we'll have to come back and talk about this because it's actually a little bit more subtle than this. And then the other rule that we wrote down Once a proposer has received promise messages for a particular proposal number, let's say n, from a majority of acceptors, it sends an accept message to majority of acceptors, where n here is the proposal number that was promised.
and val is the actual value it wants to propose. And I'm going to put two asterisks here because we have to come back to this too next time. All right. So we're about out of time for today. You might be wondering why this algorithm, why this is so complicated, right? And part of the reason it's so complicated is because it has to be tolerant of failure. So we'll start to talk about that next time. We'll start to talk about what happens uh, when processes in this that are part of this algorithm fail. Uh, somebody wanted to see this page again? Sure. All right, that's it for today. Next time we're going to come back and talk about failure, why this algorithm isn't guaranteed to terminate, and about what to do if you want to agree on a sequence of values instead of just one value. See you next time.